All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Jeremiah chapter 11. So chapters 11 through 20 are basically a narrative. It's almost a private journal or a diary. And so there are feelings and messages and reactions. It's almost a dialogue within himself and the Lord. So he puts words in the mouths of people here. All right, verses 1 through 3. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear you the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeys not the words of this covenant. All right, so some curse the covenant with Moses in Deuteronomy 11, 27, 28, and 29. If you compare that, Jeremiah is given the same curse and the same covenant that was articulated by Moses. The Lord himself links it up. And this is going to be a contrast because the work that he's going to perform later will contrast, making the work he did for Israel, taking them out of Egypt in the Exodus, will pale in significance compared to the work that he's going to do. And all through the Old Testament, we speak of him as he who delivered them out of the bonds of Egypt. The whole exodus from Egypt is a sign, an identifier that is used all through the scriptures. And we will find a place here that says he's going to eclipse that. And the whole Babylonian captivity will be more visible and more known than the exodus from Egypt. Verse 4. Which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. So you get a strange idiom here, not in an iron furnace in a literal sense, but in the sense that it was where they were refined and purified. And that phrase will also be used in the tribulation. And it's interesting that the whole Exodus period is seen as the period in which he was uh, promulgating the Mosaic Covenant. Verse 5. That I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Then answered I, and said, So be it, O Lord. So several things here. He's obviously speaking to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the curse is the same curse as the covenant. So a land flowing with milk and honey, that phrase occurs three times outside of the Torah, here and in chapter 32, verse 22, as well as Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 6 and 15. So let's take verses 6 through 13. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear you the words of this covenant, and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods to whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. So, in the Hebrew there is a play on words because the word shame and the word Baal are similar. And they almost sound the same. Back in verse 9, there is an allusion to a conspiracy. And before this is all over, we will discover that there is a secret conspiracy in a very literal and immediate sense. We do know that earlier in Jeremiah's history, that under Josiah, the good king, there was a lot of secret resistance to the reforms of Josiah. So when these evil kings came to power, it was very prevalent for the people to return to idol worship. Uh, there is another idea that no piety or religious position comes by osmosis or by being in just the collective group. All repentance to God and his ways has to be individual. They are being collectively judged, but just because they were in that group 
was no excuse. And we are dealing not only with the individual spiritual problems, at the same time we're going to see Jeremiah weep because he's presiding over the death of the nation. All right, so pray not for this people. All right, verse 14. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. So three times we hear, therefore, pray not for this people. And there is a provocative view which argues, particularly out of a passage from Hosea and several others, that there is a precedent condition for the second coming of Jesus Christ for God's power and his interruption to save Israel. And the precedent condition is that Israel acknowledges their specific iniquity. Some scholars believe that it is the rejection of the Messiah. And um, whenever we get to Zechariah, we'll cover that in a little bit more, that viewpoint. Uh, Let's move forward. Verse 15 and 16. What has my beloved to do in my house, seeing she has wrought lewdness with many, and holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil, then thou rejoiceth. The Lord called my name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So he's using several different idioms here, the virgin in the house, olive tree. Uh, Paul picks that up and he runs with it in Romans chapter 11 and he builds upon that idiom of Israel as the olive tree and the grafting and so forth. Uh, Verse 17, For the Lord of hosts that planted thee has pronounced evil against thee, for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger is in offering incense unto Baal. So he's making reference to the house of Israel as well as Judah. Don't be confused. The house of Israel had been taken into slavery over a hundred years before. And the subtle thought here is that Israel was judged and Judah would be judged no less. In fact, in concept more so because they should have the benefit of realizing how God treated the house of Israel. They went into idolatry and didn't listen. And they were warned and didn't listen and were taken into slavery. And a hundred years later, Judah doesn't listen or repent. And uh, so they're going to do the same thing. And so in the last part of this chapter, we have a very specific crisis that is the first of many personal crises in Jeremiah's life. Jeremiah was an aggressive prophet of God, and he was the victim of plots against him. Anathoth was his hometown, and it was the home of the priestly house of Abiathar, who was a friend of David. But the house was deposed by Solomon, who supplanted with the house of Zadok, the high priest. And the people of Anathoth, including his friends, family, and the people in his hometown, didn't just reject him. They were collectively involved in a plot to assassinate him. All right, verse 18 through 23. And the Lord has given me knowledge of it, and I know it when thou shows me their doings. But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter. And I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. But, O Lord of hosts, that judge righteously, that tries the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. Therefore thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth that seek thy life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord that thou not die by our hand. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. So even Judah is going to be judged here. They're going to go into captivity, but a remnant will return. And that's the whole ordeal of Ezra and Nehemiah and the return. There is 30,000 that return, but a remnant of Anathoth will not return. Other tribes will have people returning to reestablish the land. Anathoth gets their due. Jeremiah in another chapter will complain to the Lord a little too rashly. The Lord's going to correct him and recommissions him from uh, that time on he never complains again in fact the Lord watches over him but all through he gets uh, opposition and even from Zedekiah the king he gets no help because his second tier is rebellious and trying to do Jeremiah in alright that's chapter 11 thank you for joining me